Welcome to Gin Clear Aviation, my name is Dan. I have arrived at Red Hill Aerodrome, which is just inside the Gatwick CTR in the south of the UK to meet John Hunt, better known as the Flying Reporter. I want to find out why and how John began the Flying Reporter YouTube channel and also ask John how he sees the future of GA. Hi John. It's Hi. A, it's a pleasure to meet you today. Thank you so much for letting me come down to interview you. Um, what a wonderful place you've got here at Red Hill. It's a nice spot. I'm right in front of the tower, close to the loos, <laughs> <laughs> close to the fuel bay. Yeah, what's not to like? So let's just start. So you, I believe, were a BBC journalist and a producer. So how did that transition into flying and, and how did that journ journalism sort of, sort of lead to a YouTube channel? So I'd always been interested in flying. I just thought it was never going to be something for me because I wasn't clever enough. Um, I sort of flunked my A-level maths. My best friend in my class who did re really well at his A-level maths, he became a commercial airline pilot and I was always very jealous. <laughs> um, didn't go to university, you know, I went to the University of Life, I suppose, and went straight into work after my A-levels. Uh, and then was at the BBC and never really thought about flying. And then I don't know what it was, I can't remember the exact moment, but I discovered Microsoft Flight Simulator and I started playing with it and it was a real revelation to me. It was, wow, this is so real. And before long, I was flying 747 flights across the Atlantic, the whole flight from start to finish. Wow, how long did that take? <laughs> About eight hours. <laughs> um, communicating with all the kind of virtual controllers on VATSIM it's called. Um, you know, filing flight plans, doing fuel and performance calculations, the lot. So it was really real. And then around, I can't remember how long ago, sort of 13, 14 years ago, I was just coming to the end of a, a bit, bit of work that I was doing at the BBC in London. And my friends there knew I was nuts about sort of flight simming, flying, and they got me a trial flight at Biggin wow. Hill. And I'd just been left some money from a, from a relative who died. And I just did that one trial flight and that was it. I wanted to do it and just put everything into it. After you got that. the bug. Yeah. As well as in the UK, you have fans and followers all over the world. Which are the countries that follow you most? So it's really the English speaking countries, as you might imagine. Um, the audience is moving a bit at the moment, but it's, it's typically 60% UK, 20% US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and then it's Northern Europe and then it becomes, you know, <laughs> small numbers elsewhere, but, but mostly English speaking countries. But it must be interesting for these um, non-UK pilots to see how flying works in the UK though. See, this has been an interesting thing and I've wondered why after banging on at this for 10 years, the, the channel is not as popular as some of the kind of international American channels. And my only guess to it is either people hate me, <laughs> which is possible, um, but also I think we are a bit strange in the UK, the way we do fly, you know, and given that the biggest place where flying is going on is the US, they don't think it should be anything different from the way they do it. So yeah. when we talk about basic service, standard overhead joins, um, I don't know, flight following, you know, they do flight following and all this other stuff. You know, we've got this weird and wacky instrument rating that, you know, a restricted instrument rating and all the curiosities around that. And I think people, they find that hard to grasp. Yeah. And so I suppose what I'm doing now is, is trying to find ways of making the channel less about those things and the, that the dif less about the differences and more about the, the things that we, sh we have in common, sure. which is the adventure and the, you know, the inspiration of flying, really. Do you get any comments? from non-UK pilots asking you questions about the UK way? Yeah, I mean, people are curious about how we do things here. Um, I suppose one thing that non-UK viewers like is our countryside, which looks just so brilliant from yeah, there. Yeah. You know, you on a nice summer's day. Compare it with a US landscape, it's very different. I mean, I know we're not the Rocky Mountains, but you know, seeing the, the rolling green fields of Kent or whatever, and the lovely coastline of Sussex and Hampshire, it's, 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 it's stunning. Yeah. Um, and so I think that they, they, they appreciate that. I think also, we, you know, we are a bit quirky. It's, we, we take our 
airfield cafes for granted here. You know, we can't might moan about them, you know, being greasy spoons or whatever. But very often elsewhere in the world, you land at an airfield, there is nothing there. You know, a lot of Americans and Australians might not have, you know, an eatery at their at their little airfields. And so, you know, that's something that we have that they don't, which I'm quite proud of. A nice British quirk, yeah. really, isn't it? I see. Your programmes really explain well how the average pilot can use their private pilot licence to the full. Have you had any feedback from any private pilots you have inspired? Pretty much every day. Wow. Okay. And um, and when when you're having a bad day, those are the you know that's what makes it worthwhile. You know, I had I had one today. I had a left an email today. Um, some chap just contacted me through the website. Just a quick thank you for the brilliant videos you produced. I'm 67, aspiring glider pilot, and going to be doing my flight radio telephony offer, operator's license in November. Your videos have nearly replaced CAP 413, <laughs> which is, of course, the radio telephony manual. I don't know about that. It's probably most instructors will, will cringe at the thought <laughs> of that. But yeah, pretty much every day, there's, there's a really appreciative comment. And, you know, I like to think that I'm doing my bit to keep our hobby going and yeah. to bring in new, new people into, into the sector. I don't believe your audience realise how much hard work goes into creating a video. Can you briefly outline your process from the initial idea to the final YouTube video? It kind of depends on what the video is. If, if I'm going on a flight with my family, there might not be a lot of thought that goes into it before, bar you know, deciding where we're going and where we're going to stay. But then if I'm going to be sort of reporting on something, so for, for instance, recently I did a video on fire extinguishers in the in the cockpit and the some of the issues around certain types of fire extinguishers in the cockpit well we started think actually i started thinking about that two years ago or more or less two years ago um and one thing led to another it's taken a bit of time you know eventually get everyone together um and filmed it i don't know in july um edited it two or three weeks ago it's going out you know it's going out this friday today it's going out today um so, you know, something like that can take a long time. But yeah. if it's just an ordinary flight, what I try and do is I try and make it, you know, I've got, I've got past the kind of, I'm going flying, I'm going to be flying from, I don't know, L Street to Blackbush. That's not a particularly interesting proposition to somebody searching YouTube. John flies from L Street to Blackbush. I don't know, some people it might be, but for generally I found they're not that popular. So I'm always trying to look for something, either something that happened during that flight that I found interesting or something I can explain or a debriefing point that I can go into detail on. Or if I know there's something interesting about the airspace, the airfield or something like that in advance, I can, I can tailor the whole video around that. So sometimes there's a bit of thinking, sometimes there's not. And the editing can take anywhere from a day, um, I'm getting quicker and quicker at it now, which is great. Um, through to, you know, 10 days. I mean, it depends. I filmed, you know, you're an air racer, right? And I came and filmed your air racing last year at Sherbin and Elmet. And we had cameras in most of the aircraft cockpits, audio recorders in all of the aircraft cockpits, two cameras on the ground, lots of interviews and everything else. I mean, it took a week to put it all together. So yeah, it depends what the video is as to how long it takes to put it together. And you do the editing and all that yourself? So yes, mostly. Um, I do, I've recently taken on someone um, who helps as and when. Um, they're a pilot as well, which was essential because I need somebody to just be able to take the, the video footage, make sense of it, put it together without me having too much input into it. But um, I, I edit most of them at the moment. Your son and husband regularly appear with you on your adventures. How has including your family impacted the response to the videos? So I don't know how people respond to it. I know I've got lots of people who like the family, particularly my son, who I call, I call Bertie. Um, the reason I call him Bertie is, and he won't mind me saying this, is that he's an adopted child. And we wanted to protect his identity to some extent. We used to blur his face in the early days. Um, I won't go into all the reasons around that, but you know, he's now happy for me to show his face. Um, but we kind of kept his name. We ought to call him by his real name, really. Um, but he's yeah he's got this sort of persona and he's a you know he 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 loves coming and travelling with us. He prefers it when we're not filming. He you know he's a teenager. He he 
he doesn't like the spotlight too much. I, I now am at the point where I have to check with him if I'm going to put anything out that features him, I have to show him first. I think it's only respectful, you know, he's a team of 17 and I, all his friends at school follow me on Instagram. I bet they do, but they love <laughs> which it. Is, which is just crazy. Um, and whenever we go around there for birthday presents, they, their birth, birthday parties, they all come out and say, oh, it's the flying reporter. And <laughs> so it is quite funny. As for the audience, I don't know. I mean, I think I tr I've always tried to share my family as anybody else would share their own family. If, they, if, if, if it was another YouTuber and their family flying, I just do the same. And whether people appreciate it, like it, dislike it, I don't know. But, you know, they're a part of, the, of, of what I do. And, um, you know, it's nice to have them on board sometimes. And do they enjoy flying with you, going places? So James, not so much so. <laughs> um, he's always been nervous. Yeah. Um, he will like it if we're going somewhere and, and we're, we're making use of the aeroplane, um, be it Scotland, be it the south of France. Um, he, if he can see a convenience in it, he's somehow much, he copes with it much better. Um, we, we don't go on short trips together. Um, Bertie, yeah, he, he doesn't ask to come flying with me. You know, he'll come if he, you know, he, he could take it or leave it. I mean, he's very nonplussed. He sits in the back playing on his, his uh, computer game, you know, and uh, I might point out some amazing landmark and he'll just sort of look up and go, yeah, and he's back down <laughs> on his game again, you know. For him, he's grown up with it. It's, it's not nothing yeah, special. It's for, normal. For his friends and other people his age, it's, it's an amazing opportunity that he's got and I don't think he quite appreciates it. He will, he will. Have you experienced any unexpected consequences or opportunities from being well known to the GA community? I suppose the consequences are that wherever you go, people know you, and that's a lovely, a lovely thing. My my son takes the Mickey out of me about it because if somebody comes up when I'm when we're out somewhere or whatever, he'll he'll go, oh, Dad's ego and all this kind of stuff. And I say to, I say to him, what do you expect me to do? Bertie, you know, if somebody comes up to me, just say, oh, go away, don't want to talk to you. I've got to, I've got to talk to people, right? Um, and it is really, really nice because I was, I didn't feel that the aviation community would be a community that would welcome me, if I'm honest with you. I'm, you know, a bit different in lots of different ways. And the channel has really been great for that because it's, it's shown that, that I have friends everywhere. And so whenever I land anywhere and people come up and say hello, it's a lovely welcome. It, is a, it makes you feel welcome. Um, so I, I, do in, I do enjoy that. We've bumped into people on railway station, you know, in, in, in non-aviation context. I was walking through the, the centre of, of Gibraltar, uh, whatever the town is there, and somebody came up to me there. And it's just bizarre, um, you know, or on the train or walking down my own high street or whatever it is. It's quite funny. In terms of opportunities, um, lots of opportunities, you know, people, people want to support the channel, they want to be on the channel, they want to share their passion for aviation with me. So, you know, probably one of the most memorable opportunities was getting to fly the seaplane up, um, up in Scotland around Presswick and Loch Lomond and getting, you know, three days of seaplane training and being able to film it and show it. and. Uh, you know, become friends with the with the guys up there that do it, and there are there are plenty of other opportunities. Flying a Harvard, I wouldn't have had an opportunity. There's no way I would have been able to to learn to fly a Harvard. You know, it's just insane, really, the opportunities yeah. that there are. Yeah, that's fantastic, fantastic. So let's talk planes. How long have you owned your lovely Piper Arrow? Three years. Three years, actually, probably around about yes, almost three years exactly. Um, I hope I've got that right. I think it's three years. Uh, so I was, I was in shares before I bought India Victor. Um, so I was in a PA20, two PA28 shares. And unfortunately, the channel kind of outgrew the shares in the sense that everyone else in the share ended up getting pestered whenever they, that plane landed anywhere. They, they'd come up and say, well, where's John? Where's John? Where's the flying reporter? <laughs> and I'd say, no, it's my plane too. Um, so. It, it was no longer something I could keep doing. I needed, I needed to have my own um, aeroplane. And it was, at the time we were, we didn't, I, I was quite open-minded about what kind of aeroplane I was gonna get. I wanted something that could, I could tour in, um, get places fast that could operate from small strips and so on. So I was looking at all the typical light singles, including a Mooney, there was a Mooney based here I was looking at. Um, and, 
at the time there wasn't much on the market. If I'm honest with you, it was a time when when every, it was it was a time when everyone was buying aeroplanes. There was nothing left, um, and this one popped up. And I'll tell you a funny story about this one. And I didn't know it when I first started, saw it on the on the listings. This was the plane. I don't know if you, your viewers want to know this, but I had a I had an incident at Sandown. Um, I don't know, three, three and a half, four years ago. Uh, I was parked up, I just got into my plane, there was a fly-in, and an aeroplane clipped my wing as it was taxiing. Um, so I got stuck on the Isle of Wight, which wasn't much fun, but this was the plane that hit me. <laughs> really? <laughs> this was the plane that hit me. Um, just bizarre that, 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 you know, it was almost made to be, you know, yeah. in a way. So, yeah, I love, I love it. Would I have bought, this is a turbo arrow, so I don't know, would I have bought a turbo arrow? I bought it because it was a great aeroplane. It was, it was the right price. It, was, it could do everything I wanted it to do. It didn't matter to me too much that it was a turbo. It certainly means, you know, if I decide, if when I go touring across Europe and so on, where you can get up nice and high, it really does help. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's- But it is a, a, a complex single, isn't it? So you've got retractable undercarriage, constant speed prop, you've got a turbo on the engine. So those are all things you've got to manage, but I think you like that sort of thing, don't you? Yeah, I do. Um, I do. I talk, and I, in all my videos, I talk about it. You know, I'm going to cool the engine down a bit now. You know, coming back on the manifold pressure and, you know, juggling that that 1970s turbo on the takeoff and, you know, the the annoyance of having to run it down for five minutes after you've parked up and. Um, yeah, I think that's part of the professionalism of being a pilot is, is knowing your airplane and managing it and operating it well and keeping it running perfectly. Um, yeah, I mean, this, I've still got things to learn about it, I'm sure, but um, it's it's great. It's great for me because I can. It's like a PA, it's like a PA twenty eight, but it just goes faster and it's got bigger low capacity. I mean, the 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 capacity on the I've got a, I've got a fly on my uh, spider. It's got you know wing, the fuel capacity two hundred and seventy two liters, so you've got five and a half hours or whatever thereabouts. Um, you can do one hundred and thirty knots in it. I can carry so much stuff in it. The max weight twenty nine hundred pounds. Um, it's it's a it's a stupidly impressive machine really for what it is, and but it can get out of places like this. So the five hundred meter runway that we'll be using later, it can operate from that. Um, it's tight on some days, I'll be honest with you, if I've not managed the weight and everything properly. And grass strips, it seems happy, you know, happy getting in and out of grass strips. And I even landed on a beach, so, you know, it's a great thing. With an aging pilot population and an increase in fuel and maintenance costs, how can we increase awareness of the positive effects of general aviation? Well, I like to think that's what I do, um, you know, day to day. That's, that's kind of what I do. I, I sort of describe what I do as making inspirational general aviation content. Um, how, how else we can do it? I think, I think airfields have got a lot to answer for in this as well, because I think airfields need to be welcoming places, open door, um, you know, a lot of them do have great cafes and they do bring in, you know, look at places like Shobden, uh, not Shobden, yes, yeah, Shobden even, Shobden, Sherbin and Elmet, you know, great cafes, the locals come in, the bikers come in, even Compton Abbas, you know, a nice plush place, you know, it has all the bikers and all the classic cars coming in. And it's that, that's what we need. I think we need more of that. Um, personally, I think, you know, the airfields need to be more welcoming, allowing, vis you know, welcoming visitors in so that we, you know, we do inspire. I used to love it when over there at the cafe, you know, you'd have the kids on the uh, on the fence there, you know, as you're taxiing past, waving at you. Know it was a bit of a hazard to be honest, because you're trying to taxi down a tight taxiway <laughs> whilst waving at the kiddie at the same time. But um, yeah, I think that would be good. And I think we've all just got to share it, and we've all we've, we've all got to, you know, get on, you know, post post your flights and talk to your friends, take your friends flying, and um, you know, I've got I kind of have a policy where if I've got a free seat, and I I, I think my I can handle a passenger because you can't always handle a passenger if you've got a busy day of work going on. You know, I, I'm gonna, you know I've got a, a, a mailing list where I, I say like, I'm going to be going from here to here if anyone wants to join me. The only problem is you're going to have to drive back from wherever or get a train. But uh, so, yeah, I think we can all do that, can't we? You know, we all fly with, with, with free seats now and then. What can we look forward to from the Flying Reporter? So I've got a big ambition 
and I don't know if I'm going to achieve it. And you're kind of the first sort of public person, I suppose. I've, I've, I've not mentioned it, I don't think, publicly on the YouTube channel. Um, but I want to take India Victor across the Atlantic. Um, I know there's risks associated with that, but it's just a dream that I've had. I want to take it over the Atlantic, do a bit of touring around America, maybe go to Oshkosh with it. I don't know. Um, so current plan is to try and get the full IR. Um, I'm thinking of probably doing that in the States um, just because I don't have the time for the UK theoretical knowledge studies, which are just just over the top for what we're, we're going to be doing. Um, so I'm thinking of doing it in the States, converting it over here, and then I've got the IR for that. And I also want to, you know, I want to, I want to tour more, you know, money's been tight, you know, we've all been under a cost of living crisis, you know, we can't afford to go bombing off to Eastern Europe or whatever all the time, but I need to do more of that. So I suppose, yeah, in terms of what to expect, that's, that's, that's what I'd like to do. There's loads of content that's already filmed. Um, I flew in a Cessna Skymaster the other week, which is the pushy, pull me thing, uh, 337, I think it is, Cessna 337. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've got, I've got three or four months of footage um, already in the can of, of you know, uh, uh, of videos to go. So there's, there's, you know, the whole of the summer is still to be shown on the YouTube channel. So John, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you today and, and having a chat with you. And I, and I wish you all the best with your channel. I really look forward to seeing the, the future episodes on YouTube. Well, thanks for having me. Great to see you. Do you fancy going for a flight? We can uh, take a little... I mean, look at the weather. God, I'd absolutely <laughs> love to. If it's, if it's We're offered. here. The weather's wonderful. It's rare. Let's go, let's go flying. Let's go. Where do you fancy going? Well, I thought we could go to Rochester. Um, I recently considered a diversion there and I kind of shied away from it because I haven't been there for such a long time. And I remember it being a bit tricky not long after getting my PPL. So I thought we could just go there. It's like 13 minutes. Down the, Absolutely down the amazing. M20 or whatever. Let's do it. John and I went for a wonderful flight from Red Hill to Rochester and back. We talked further in the cockpit. Check this adventure out on my next video. It's been great chatting with John and hearing his amazing story. Please follow and like if you can, as this really helps me build my channel. Until next time, wishing you clear skies ahead. This is Dan from Gin Clear Aviation.